Welcome uh, everyone, really delighted to be here today. So um, as you mentioned, I'm going to talk through what we're doing here in London. Um, and I think particularly it's worth uh, noting that um, we're thinking about this in the context of the climate emergency and also in relation to the pandemic and how we can engage with that as well. Um, so, uh, oh, is that? Sorry, uh, technical issues. Okay, um, so I think it's fair to say that the mayor is committed to an environmentally focused recovery and retrofit is really seen to be key to that, but London has a lot of challenges to address. So um, fuel poverty is now predominantly an urban issue. So although London has lots of areas that are very well off, um, uh, we have 10 areas in London that are in the highest uh, areas for deprivation for fuel poverty and London has consistently lost out from supplier obligation funding which has made it really hard to uh, draw in the funding to deliver the works that we need to be doing. And then in addition to the general barriers to decarbonising, London is housing stock which is expensive and challenging to treat. So we've got a huge amount of solid wall properties, we've got a large amount of flats which are really complicated in terms of uh, the sort of leasehold freehold issues, we've got a huge amount of um, conservation areas, and we've got a really high number of um, people in the privately rented sector which is the least thermally efficient of all of the tenures and particularly in London I think which is different to the privately rented sector in some other parts of the country we don't have a huge amount of the sector that really competes on quality um, and as you can see from this slightly terrifying trajectory of the historic carbon emissions um, carbon savings from energy efficiency programs compared to what we need to be doing we just aren't remotely on a trajectory to meeting the zero carbon ambitions um, and i think it's also worth recognizing that however terrifying that trajectory is that hasn't yet been updated so that's to 2050 and the mayor has brought forward the target to 2030 so that just becomes even more precipitous we did have some previous government schemes which had scope for larger scale measures such as solid wall but we don't currently have that Eco is now targeted at those who are in fuel poverty with a sort of corollary that many people would now be effectively considered to be in the able to pay sector, but they just aren't. And even with uh, mayoral activity and the wider market delivery, we've only done about 600,000 homes and those have been relatively light interventions. So we're not getting into the number of homes that we need to be getting into and we're certainly not getting into them and doing the level of interventions that we need to be doing. And so I think has been touched on um, by the previous speakers, the current situation we have is one where there just isn't the regulatory context or the sufficient supply or demand to generate the necessary scale and start to really change the trajectory and start to move that curve. Um, so in terms of the regulatory context, theoretically, we do have the sort of uh, the policy certainty. So UK is to be net zero by 2050. We've got the clean growth strategy, but they aren't backed up by the sorts of levels of ambition and the clarity around what needs to be done. We don't have any sort of pathway for the decarbonisation of heat. And then the things that we do have are quite small, really, in relation to drivers around energy efficiency, primarily things like the minimum energy efficiency standards. In London, that only covers about uh, 30 to 40,000 properties. So that's about a quarter of the trajectory that we need to do in one year. And we just don't have the levels of funding in local authorities to be able to enforce it. We're due to have the heat and building strategy and energy white paper, but um, they're due in autumn, so we'll see when autumn uh, comes this year. And then, as has been touched on by other speakers, the supply chain is a real issue. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that although these are different elements, they're all interrelated. And so even if we had the regulatory context, we don't have the supply chain or the demand side to be able to um, generate the numbers that we need. So if government tomorrow said, here's all of the money and the regulations that you need, we simply don't have the supply chain there at the moment. 
It's been decimated after the Green Deal and it's really lacking confidence. And um, the construction sector, it's an aging workforce and it's now seen as an, uh, it isn't seen as an occupation of choice, it's more a last resort. It's fragmented, skills and performance gaps um, and all of the sorts of issues that others have spoken about. In London, what that translates into is a real difficulty in being able to draw in energy company obligation funding. And when we look at things like the numbers of companies in London that are PAS 2035 or PAS 2030 um, qualified as a proxy for quality because we need the works to be done properly, we're looking at over a thousand years for some of the measures to be installed on the basis of the capacity that we've got. And then on the demand side, just generally, we just don't have um, people who really value energy efficiency and they don't seem to find it as cool and sexy as me and some others might do. So it doesn't really act as a factor when buying, renting or renovating a home, there's a lack of knowledge, interest, motivation, and then the sorts of landlord tenant splits, leasehold freehold splits, all sorts of issues around hassle and disruption. They're perceived to be an issue and a barrier, but we know that people are prepared to put up with uh, disruption and hassle when they are getting things done to their home that they really want so they're prepared to put up with it when they're looking at having kitchens done or extensions or locker conversions but because they just don't value it it's seen as a much bigger issue for energy efficiency and levels of fuel um, bills just aren't sufficient to drive the business case per, certainly at an individual level and where they are high enough to be a problem they're for those who are in fuel poverty and they aren't able to afford the retrofit so I'm just going to take you through some of what we're doing in London to try and get to zero carbon whilst protecting those who are most vulnerable and trying to do what we can to create those conditions for scale. So we're working in partnership to try and remove the barriers to decarbonisation. So we've got Fuel Poverty Partnership that's working with a range of different um, stakeholders from across the sector to try and look at what we can do to uh, support those who are most vulnerable. We're doing some work around building passports because we know that in the absence of any regulation to drive this, we need to try and go with the grain of how people renovate their homes. Most people, even if they're not doing it from an energy perspective, don't retrofit their homes in one go. Um, and so if we can find a way to make building passports something that is meaningful and integrated into how people go about renovating their homes, then we think that that could be a real benefit. We know, as you said, um, as lots of speakers have said before, that lots of works are happening. And so we just need to try and find ways to do them in a more carbon efficient way. We're part of the Coalition of Energy Efficient Buildings Zero Carbon Heating Task Force, um, looking at how we can try and create uh, um, investable offers that are going to try and generate the change. And obviously we're lobbying for more powers. We're trying to build a pipeline. We have just uh, published a retrofitting heat pump study to try and help people understand when and how they can retrofit heat pumps into existing buildings. We're doing work through Sharing Cities, which is looking at uh, demand side response, particularly focused around fuel poor households. We want to make sure that those who are least well off are still able to uh, be a part of the energy transition. And we know that a flexible energy supply is going to be crucial to that. We have the Warmer Homes and the Warmer Homes Advice Service, which is targeted at fuel poor households. And we're looking to take a whole house approach and really um, look holistically. So a lot of the measures that we're delivering are things like damp, mould, ventilation and remedial repairs. So we're looking um, just beyond the energy to make sure that the home is going to be well looked after. And then we've got the retrofit accelerator for homes and part of that is also the energy leap program where we're trialing the energy strong approach and that is really about working with social landlords to help them build the business case for deeper levels of retrofit. And then finally, we're looking at how we can scale up. So we're working with London councils, working with all of the boroughs to see how we can deliver more retrofits, how we can help to support the uh, supply chain and bring in funding. We've got Solar Together London, which is our reverse solar auction, trying to um, bring people together to catalyze action in a relatively short amount of time to install solar. 
And then finally, we're one of the partners in the UK Green Building Council led Accelerator Cities programme. We're working with a range of other cities and other stakeholders to look at how we can really start to work together and drive retrofit. So we're particularly looking at things like one stop shops and uh, trying to make it easy for people to take action. So that's a very quick whistle stop talk. Thank you.